Greetings. Uh, we have a test in here one week from Thursday. Um, the uh, examination is closed, but closed note. You're allowed to have two sheets of paper on which you can write anything you like. I'll be announcing Thursday exactly where the test material ends this coming Thursday. Okay. In the book. In other words, you're responsible for the. How about next Tuesday? No, I can't do that. Okay, I will think about this and get back with you before the lecture's over. Okay, I was, ah, uh, I don't know where in my mind I was thinking that we had this Thursday and next Tuesday was off. Okay, I'm on a different calendar, clearly. So let me, uh, let me think about that. Maybe during the break between classes, I'll examine and give you a, a stop place for that. Last time we were looking at the sum process, and this is a generic sum process. We're looking at the sum of n IID random variables. They are independent and identically distributed. This is an overlap of a slide that we went over. S of n is equal to the summation of k is equal to 1 to n of um, k is equal to 1 to n of IID random variables. <coughs> The x sub k's again are iid, independent and identically distributed. We have determined in such a case that the expected value of the sum is equal to n times the expected value of one of the components of the random variable, which we will call x bar, and also the variance is add. Therefore, for iid random variables, the means add and the variance is add for iid random variables. The means always add, even for correlated random variables. Only for IID random variables do the variances add. We wanted to ask ourselves, if we had a sum process of this sort, what was the corresponding autocorrelation? And we ended up uh, last time going over the following derivation. <coughs> we went through an argument that showed that the, well, at least the cross covariance was equal to the minimum of n and k. And what we're doing now is we're taking the expected value of the sum at n and the sum at k. Well, clearly, <clears throat> depending on the relative magnitudes of n and k, one of those sums is going to be subsumed in the other sum. The summation from 1 to 4 is subsumed in the summation from 1 to 20, right? One is a kind of a subset of the other one. And it makes a difference which is subsumed in the other one whether the k is subsumed to the n or the n is subsumed in the k. So therefore, the order, which one is the minimum or maximum in this, is very, very important. So it's the minimum of n and k times the variance of uh, an individual random variable was what the autocovariance was equal to. And we ended up last time doing this. <clears throat> Let's take a look at the uh, Bernoulli sum process. Now, for Bernoulli sum, what are we doing? We're taking a summation of x sub k of this type, where each one of these is an IID Bernoulli random variable. Well, the expected value of a Bernoulli random variable, if you remember, is equal to p times q. And the variance, no, I'm sorry, the expected value is p. Sorry about that. The expected value is p. And the variance of the random variable is equal to pq, which, of course, is p times 1 minus p, the q always standing for a 1 minus p in this case. So we have both the expected value and the variance. So therefore, if we have this summation of independent um, identically distributed Bernoulli trials, we can obtain the expected value of uh, x, the variance of x, simply substitute into the original definition that we had and uh, come up with the corresponding result. Now, for the bipolar case, which is the second one, by the way, this is what we get. The variance of x is equal to pq, and the autocovariance is equal to uh, the minimum of n and k times the variance, which, of course, is pq. Remember what the bipolar case was for the Bernoulli random variable? The binary, for the binary, the output was 0 and 1. For the bipolar, 
the output was a minus one and a one. In other words, the logic zero took on the value of a minus one. This had the advantage that it had a zero mean probability and also that it will serve as the root for the derivation of the Wiener process. So for the bipolar case, the variance of x is equal to 4 times pq. You can see it's simply a scaling of the original variance. Since the peak-to-peak -peak value has doubled before it was 0 to 1, now the peak-to-peak -peak value has doubled from minus 1 to 1, so from an interval of 1 to 2 in terms of the peak-to-peak -peak value. Therefore, since the variance is uh, a squaring sort of operation, that means that the variance is going to go up by a factor of 4 or 2 squared. So for the bipolar case, the variance is equal to 4 times PQ. And again, for the bipolar case, if we're taking the sum of NIID random variables and we're adding all of those up, then the uh, autocovariance for the bipolar case is equal to 4 times the minimum of N and K. There it is again, since one of, the sums, one of the sums is subsumed in the other sum. Four minimum of n and k times pq for the bipolar case. We'll look at another important uh, stochastic phenomena, which is called a Poisson random process. A Poisson random process is, as we mentioned previously, the occurrence of popping of popcorn, of cars going by the lane, of raindrops hitting on a tin roof. Any time where you have random occurrences that have basically the same sort of frequency, averaging on the time, that is a Poisson random process. If you have dots which are randomly uh, uh, distributed on a page, it's a two-dimensional Poisson random process. Here's how we're going to derive and we're going to think about the Poisson random process. We're going to take an interval of length t. And we can think of this as a time interval. So if you can see this, this is a just a line segment on the line, an interval of length t. And what we're going to do is we're going to place n random points on these lines. How do we do that? Well, we take a random uh, number generator that's random on the interval from 0 to t. And we just generate n iid random variables and see where those points lie on that line. So there's one, there's one, there's one. Say I have them coming in from all over. So we have a whole bunch of them. You can't see them on the TV, can you? Okay. So to get the idea, here we've placed n random points just randomly on the interval from 0 t. Now we're going to choose a subinterval of length little t. The subinterval here is little t. And we're going to ask ourselves, what is the probability that out of these n points, k of them appear in this subinterval? Well, you notice that each time we choose a random point, that's a Bernoulli trial. It's a success if it lies on the subinterval. It's not a success if it lies on the big interval, right? So each one, of these in, each one of these occurrences is a Bernoulli trial. So we have a Bernoulli trial, and we have a probability of success corresponding to the probability that it lies on this small interval. Well, what is the probability that the random variable, or, or uh, that, that the point lies on this small interval? Well, it's equal to the ratio of little t to big T, isn't it? That's equal to the probability that we have a success for one individual Bernoulli trial, one independent choice of a random point on the interval from 0 to t. We repeat this n times. If we repeat Bernoulli trials, what sort of random variable do we have? A, um, a what? Binomial. <laughs> so the probability of finding k points on the subinterval is a binomial random variable, and the probability of k points, as we know from uh, elementary probability, is n choose k, p to the k, q to the n minus k, where q, of course, is equal to 1 minus p. So that's a probability of finding exactly k points on that subinterval. <coughs> Now, the Poisson random process takes this previous problem of choosing points randomly on the interval from 0 to t, and it does a couple of things. It will take that interval t, big T, and make it go to infinity such that small t remains the same. Well, if you take big T and go to infinity, then, gosh, your probability 
of having a point on that little interval goes to zero eventually. So we're going to keep on adding points as we increase this. Um, and we're going to look at the Poisson approximation, first of all, for k big and p small. Because clearly, as we make uh, k and n, if you will, bigger and bigger, that the probability p becomes smaller and smaller. Then we come with what is referred to as the Poisson approximation. You might have seen this, hopefully you've seen this, in uh, elementary probability theorem, theory, where the binomial can be expressed as a Poisson random variable. How many have this ring a bell as far as having seen this before? One person. OK. Well, here's what's interesting. For this actually should be n. If n is big and p is small, then the probability that k points around that subinterval can be approximated by a Poisson, uh, a Poisson random variable. Now, the probability, what's the probability of success? We said it was the ratio of the small interval to the big interval, little t over big T. So therefore, what we do in this expression from here to here is we simply take every place there's a p and we replace it by little t over big T. Then we get this Poisson approximation that we have here. Let me then give you a quick derivation of the Poisson approximation. It says, again, the binomial becomes the Poisson. We also know the binomial becomes what? A Gaussian. Can it become a Poisson and a Gaussian? Sure, because a Poisson goes eventually to a Gaussian anyway. But it turns out intermediately in the morphism from one to the other, it can go into the Poisson. So here we have it. For n big and p small. The number of points we choose being very, very big, and the probability of a success being very, very small. You'll notice that if n is big and p is small, this implies k, which is the number of successes you have, is much, much less than n. Because p is a very, very small number. p is much, much less than 1, and p is equal to k over n. That's a probability of having a success. That's a point estimate of having a probability of success, is k over n. So therefore, here's our assumptions, k big, I'm sorry, n big, the number of points being very large, the probability of a success being very small. This assumption implies that k, the number of your successes, is much, much smaller than n, your number of points. In such case, we want to show that the binomial random variable yeah, is your TV screen flickering? Was it flickering? I'm trying to figure out if it's my monitor here or if it's this. I guess it's the monitor, which is OK. OK, good. We want to show that, indeed, that this binomial is approximately equal to a Poisson. Here's why. Let's first of all look at the n choose k. Can we zoom out, please, a little bit here? Thank you. n choose k, of course, if we were to look at the definition of n choose k, is given by this expression. And if we were to expand this out, we could keep the k factorial in the denominator and the n factorial over the n minus k right as a product in the numerator. Here's what the claim is. If k is a very, very small number, if k is a very, very small number, then each one of these numbers is about equal to itself, especially if n is really, really big. Each one of these terms is about equal to n if k is very, very small. So therefore, we have a total of k terms here, 1, 2, 0, 1, 2, k minus 1. We have a total of k terms in the top. So each one of these is about equal to n under our approximation. So therefore, the numerator is about equal to n to the k under the Poisson assumption. You with me? Furthermore, if we look at q to the n minus k, where does that occur? That occurs in this term here, q to the n minus k. <clears throat> that, of course, is equal to 1 minus p to the n minus k. Well, if k is very, very small with respect to n, this is about equal to 1 minus p to the n, right? Because n is about equal to n minus k under our approximation. Furthermore, if p is very, very small, then this is a Taylor series expansion of e to the minus p. I know I'm doing a little hand waving here, but certainly asymptotically you can see the justification for these substitutions. So therefore, we have q to the n minus k under these Poisson assumptions. q to the n minus k is equal to e to the minus np. Well, it's simply a matter of choosing, of applying n choose k here with this approximation, 
and q to the n minus k here with this approximation, the p to the k, you'll notice, just carries over straightforwardly. And we are left with the uh, Poisson approximation. So this is a, not a proof, but kind of a justification of the Poisson approximation. So here's the point, here's what we have. The probability that we have k points under the Poisson approximation, n very, very large, k very, very small, or equivalently n very, very large, and p very, very small. They're equivalent uh, assumptions. That we will refer to as the Poisson assumption. The probability of getting k points is rigorously a binomial, but becomes closer and closer to a, uh, a Poisson random variable under the conditions that p is small and n is big. And the smaller p gets and the bigger that n gets, the better and better this approximation becomes. If you remember what was p in our problem, p was the ratio of that small interval to the large interval, little t to big t. So we're going to take p and we're going to make that substitution here, e to the minus uh, t over t, and so we obtain this result. Now, here's where we're going to make things go to infinity. We're going to do the following. We're going to let n go to infinity such that lambda is equal to n over t. The frequency of points remains constant. Let me explain to you what I mean. We're going to let n go to infinity, so the number of points on that interval goes to infinity. We're also going to let t go to infinity, the big value of t. Little value of t stays the same, but the big value of t gets bigger and bigger. Let me draw a picture of it. So here was our original point. Here was t. In fact, let me do it kind of in a perspective, pedagogically. Here's our big value of t, and here's our little value of t in this interval. And we have n, which is equal to the number of points on here. So we have a number of points on here, which are uniformly distributed. What we are going to do is we're going to let t get very, very big. So t is going to get really, really big. Fill up the entire board. So here is going to be t. And our interval t, little t is going to stay exactly the same. And also the number of points is going to increase. So that means that t will go to infinity, and n will go to infinity in some sort of manner. Now, you'll notice in doing this that we are getting the bigger the value of t and the bigger value of n, the closer we are approaching the Poisson approximation. Because one of the criteria for the Poisson approximation is that t becomes infinity. What's the other one? The other one is that the probability much be, must be less, less than, much, much less than 1. So the smaller the probability gets, the closer we get to the Poisson approximation. Clearly, if we keep this interval of t the same and make the big interval go to infinity, that probability becomes diminishingly small, doesn't it? Now, we are going to take, oh, here's the question. We let t go to infinity and n go to infinity. In what way are we going to do this? We're going to do this in such a way that the number of samples over the interval of time. Now, what is this? This is the density of points, isn't it? This is the number of points per time interval, if this is a time axis. We're going to do it so that the number of points per time interval remains a constant. We will call this constant lambda. So therefore, if we double the length, we're going to double the points on it. We triple it. We make three times as many points on it. We increase big T by a factor of a million. We increase the number of points on that interval by a factor of a million. So we are keeping this lambda equal to n over t constant in making this approximation. When we do this, again, we are satisfying the Poisson approximation. We're doing it exactly. n becomes very, very large. p becomes very, very, very small. Now, let's look back here at our expression. Remember what we're doing. We're letting n over t, which is the number of samples per interval, remain constant. Let's look at our, uh, our uh, relationship here. 
You'll notice that very nicely that n over t, which is the number of points per sample interval, occurs quite nicely in here, doesn't it? It occurs quite nicely. So every time we have an n over capital T and n over capital T, we're going to call that lambda because we're going to make t go to infinity in such a way that n over t, over capital T, remains constant. So lambda is equal to n over t, and then this expression becomes the probability of k points on an interval t is equal to this expression. These are referred to as a Poisson points process. So with that, let me explain to you our interpretation of this result. Because we have kind of left behind us this idea of taking a line and putting random points on the line. Because t has gone to infinity. How do you place random points on something which is infinitely long? It becomes very, very difficult. Well, here's what we have done. Here is our final interpretation of what's going on. We have a line which is a function of t. And now we have let n go to infinity. We have let uh, p go to 0. And we have a bunch of points here. And these points are parameterized totally by lambda. This, again, is the popcorn sort of situation where you go pop, 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 pop. pop. Or cars going by the interstate out here. Uh, Drops of rain hitting the roof as a function of time. All of these are, are, are Poisson processes. And it is parameterized by lambda, which is the average number of occurrences per second. Clearly, if you have a Poisson process that goes pop, 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 that is going to have a higher lambda, a, a, a larger number of points per time interval than does the Poisson process pop, 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 pop. The second one has a much, much lower occurrence of uh, points per unit interval, doesn't it? So the lambda characterizes the average number of points that you are going to get per interval. How would you think you would characterize lambda? If I were to give you a Poisson process and you didn't know lambda and you were asked to characterize what lambda was, how would you estimate it? Take a big interval, count the events, and take the ratio. That's your average number of events per interval. That's how you would do it. Now, let me show you what we have shown in here. We have shown that in this time interval, we take any value here, and let's let this interval be little t. I'm, I'm being a little ambiguous on my terminology here. Now, t is the interval a sub-interval of the time axis. And we ask ourselves, on this interval of time, what is the probability that there are exactly k points on this line? And this interval can be anything. It can be two seconds, five years, two picoseconds. doesn't matter what the interval is. But what we have shown is the probability that there is exactly k points on this line is equal to the uh, Poisson random variable. Now, what would you expect in general if t was the same and lambda increases? More or less points. Don't look at the math. Look at the problem. If t remained the same and lambda increases, what do you think this probability would do? It would increase also, right? Because the occurrence of points on the interval would become larger and larger and larger. Um, and so this becomes how we place what we'll refer to as Poisson points. And we will use Poisson points for a number of different random process characterizations. <clears throat> Let's look at one. Well, before we look at one, let's, let's just reiterate what we just said. That we have finally um, arrived at the probability that the k points on the interval of t equal to this result, which is only a function of lambda. The only parameter of a Poisson process is lambda, the, number of, the average number of occurrences of points per second. 
It's a Poisson process with a parameter of lambda occurrences per unit time. And we mentioned some of the modeling here of popcorn rain, both in space and time. If you have rain which is falling on a sidewalk, and you look at the points where the raindrops fall, you can think of having a square, and at every raindrop is a random point which is being distributed in that two-dimensional space. You can actually characterize that as a spatial Poisson process. We won't be doing that here, but that is something that uh, we can do. Passing cars, um, shot noise, um, and packet arrival times in a computer, um, computer system are all modeled using the Poisson process. So, so like the Gaussian, it's a very, very powerful theoretical model because it has a number of applications. Let's look at some different processes corresponding to the Poisson points. You'll notice that the Poisson points themselves do not make a stochastic process. We can use the Poisson points to um, give, to, to derive stochastic processes, and that's what we're going to do. We'll first of all look at the Poisson counting process, X of T, where we do the following. We're going to place some Poisson points on a line, and these Poisson points on a line are going to be such that, <laughs> we're going to have a staircase. So every time that we hit a Poisson point, we ratchet up one interval, an interval. So we go here, we hit another Poisson point, we go up. So we get a staircase in accordance to the occurrence of the Poisson uh, points. We'll refer to this as a Poisson counting process. This is what you would happen, this is what would happen if you had a counter which was counting the occurrences of Poisson random variables. This would be the result of your counter after, say, t seconds. Now, we ask ourselves, if this is x of t, this now is a stochastic process because it has a value assigned to it for every point in time. We can ask ourselves, what is the probability that x of t is equal to k? That is, we choose a value of t out here, and we ask ourselves, what is the probability that this value is equal to k, given that every time we hit a Poisson point, we go up one interval, and one interval only? Well, the probability that x of t is equal to k, that is, this point here, this value of time is equal to k, is exactly the same as the probability that the number of points on this interval was equal to k, right? It's a probability that the number of points on the interval between my two fingers was exactly equal to k. And that's given by the Poisson process. It's equal to e to the minus lambda t, lambda t to the k over k factorial. So this be, then becomes the probability that x of t is equal to k. <clears throat> now, if you recall, for a Poisson random variable, if we had a Poisson random variable with a parameter of ka, which looked like this, for the Poisson process, a is equal to lambda t. But usually, when you're introduced to the Poisson process in elementary probability, a is just a parameter of the Poisson process. If you recall that x bar was the variance of x, which was equal to a, and um, the interesting thing about the Poisson is that the mean and the variance are exactly the same, which is really strange. The mean and the variance are both equal to A. Do you remember that? Very, very strange property of the Poisson. The mean and the variance are both equal to A. So with this idea in mind, we look back at the previous case where A was equal to lambda t, and we see that the expected value of lambda t or x of t is equal to lambda t. And this is very interestingly true. If you were to go out and you were to look at a Poisson process with a value of lambda, and let's suppose we've really, we really have a high value of lambda, either that or we've really zoomed out on things. So here's the value of lambda. Here's the Poisson points which occur to lambda. This is a fun thing to do if you have spare time. And you would actually plot then the counting process, you would clearly have a little staircase that would go up like a staircase. But when you zoom back far enough from this, you find out that this staircase is almost exactly a straight line corresponding to lambda t. Now, if clearly, if, if, if you look at it close enough, you'll find out that there's little staircases in here. But the fit is remarkably uh, well good. Well good? Well good.
I don't know what I was going to say. Anyway, the, 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 the result is very nice. So this is exactly what we would expect for the expect for um, the result of the expected value of the process. So this is the expected value of x of t for a Poisson process. Let's look at the uh, Poisson process for um, the Poisson counting process, and let's look at it in terms of an increment process. And indeed, it is an increment process, because what are we doing here? We're taking the value of x of t, whatever it is, and we're waiting for the next Poisson occurrence, and then we're ratcheting up for a value of 1. So therefore, it is an independent increment process. <coughs> We're going to derive it much like a sum process. In order to look at the two-dimensional probability density function for the Poisson process, we're going to look at the probability that x of t is equal to i and x of tau is equal to j. Now, this reminds us of the sum process in the sense that depending on i and j, one of these random variables is kind of subsumed in the other one, right? If i is smaller, then x of t is the number of points which occurred uh, which, which occurs to get you to a value of i, whereas j is larger, then the i interval is subsumed in the larger interval, right? Let me go through the math. We can basically do this best by breaking up x of t, this is equivalent to x of t is equal to i, and x of tau minus x of t is equal to j minus i. This is under the assumption that j is greater than or equal to i, and tau is greater than or equal to t. In other words, we have Poisson points here. And we choose a value of, uh, which one's bigger? Tau is bigger. Choose a value of t. And we choose a value of tau. And clearly, the Poisson process at this point, the counting process, is going to be greater than or equal to the value that it is here, simply because it's a strictly increasing function. So therefore, we're going to assume that in the second case, the j is the bigger value, and i is the smaller value. So again, we're assuming only for the case where tau is greater than, greater than or equal to t, and j is greater than or equal to i. That will be our assumption. Now, in this Poisson process, we're going to have the staircase every time it goes up by an interval of 1. And we're going to have two random variables. We're going to have this random variable, which is x of t, and we're going to have this random variable, which is x of tau, in the Poisson process. We're going to ask ourselves, what is the probability that x of t is equal to i and x of tau is equal to j? I maintain that that's the same thing as the probability that x of, tau, x of t is equal to i. That is, the number of occurrences between the origin and here in the Poisson counting process is equal to i. And then if this is equal to j, how many points do we have to have between here and here? j minus i, right? So in, this is times the probability that x of tau minus x of t is equal to j minus i. It's saying exactly the same thing. Do you agree with me? Uh, under, under these assumptions, my derivation assumes these inequalities. Assuming these inequalities, this is indeed true. Now, can anybody tell me why I like the second expression better than the first? Uh, yes, because I'm looking at the number of occurrences in a time interval, and why is that a neat thing to do? It's a Poisson process again. Yes, but I'm looking for one other word. Independent. The number of points on this interval are totally independent of the number of points on this interval. Do you remember how we derived the Poisson process? We just 
started with the finite interval and placed the points randomly? Well, the number of points in one interval is stochastically independent of the points within another interval. So that's the reason that I like to break them up. Because in this point, in, in this expression, these are independent random variables. And I can write that probability of the logical end as the product of the probabilities. It allows me to write it as the product of the probabilities. Notice I'm using the same flavor of analysis that I did on the sum process. Remember where we did a summation of IID random variables? And we said that the difference between two intervals was independent of the difference between two, uh, the number of uh, points, <laughs> the difference of the stochastic process on an interval was independent of the number uh, of, of the difference of the, uh, of this. Okay. I got my tongue wrapped around my eye teeth. Remember in the summation, in the IID random process, we also had a staircase, except that the IID sum process was a discrete random variable, where this is a continuous random variable. And what we said is that if we took any two non-overlapping intervals, any two non-overlapping non intervals, that the difference between this point and this point was independent of the difference between this point and this point. This was a fundamental observation that we did in deriving the, remember the minimum of n and k? It was fundamental because the difference between the two points in this interval is simply equal to the number of occurrences of random variables. It's equal to the subtotal within this interval. And the difference between here and here is equal to the subtotal of the random variables in the original process in that second interval. And so they're independent of each other. And that independence allowed us to analyze the uh, underlying stochastic process. We're doing the same thing here. We're saying that the number of points in this interval is independent of the number of points in this interval because they are non-overlapping. And the number of points in this interval, or the value of the stochastic process here is the number of points in this interval. And if we take this result minus this result, it's the number of points, Poisson points in this interval. And those are independent of each other because they are non-overlapping. So we're using the same flavor of the results of the sum process here in this in, uh, independent increments process. So we have this. And this is kind of exciting, because this is a Poisson process with a parameter lambda t, because lambda, we're assuming, is a given parameter of the process. And this is a Poisson process with a parameter of lambda tau minus t, because the interval between this point and this point is tau minus t. So the probability of getting exactly j minus 1 points in here is equal to a Poisson process with a, uh, uh, with a value equal to lambda times the total interval. So with that in mind, we can return to our overhead. And that explains the jump to the uh, next result, <clears throat> again, we started here. We've broken it up into the disjoint intervals, as we said. We take advantage of the fact now that these two statements are statistically independent of each other. Therefore, we can break it down into the product of the probabilities because they're independent of each other. This first one is a Poisson process with a parameter of lambda t and a value of i. So the parameters, the probability that we have exactly i points in that first interval is equal to lambda t to the i e to the minus lambda t over i factorial. In a similar fashion, the probability that we have exactly j minus i points in that second interval from the interval from t to tau is equal to the expression that we have here. Lambda t minus tau is the uh, a value. That's the, that's the value that we uh, place here. And then j minus i is the number of points that we are talking about. So therefore, that is the interesting aspect about this. And we then get to the joint probability mass function. This probability that x of t is equal to i and x of tau is equal to j is a probability mass function and is equal to the expression that we have here. 
what we'll do now is keep on talking. I was going to take a break because I heard people outside, but it's not enough time yet. Okay, let's then look at the autocorrelation. We're going to build now our, our, our result, by the way, and where we're headed is as follows. We have this Poisson counting process. We want to evaluate its mean, and we want to evaluate its autocorrelation, or equivalently its autocovariance. That's where we're going. Those are the two things that we're evaluating here. In fact, this whole chapter is centered around doing that. So we have the mass function. Now we're going for the autocorrelation. The autocorrelation is the expected value of x of t times x of tau. Right? Go like that. Right? That's the expected value. That's the definition of the autocorrelation function. Now, as before, and this is, this is something we're going to see again and again, so pay close attention to it. We're going to try to take this expected value, and we're going to try to, try to break it up so that it is the expected value of independent processes. Because with independent processes, we can take compound probabilities and make them into products of simpler probabilities. We can take compound expectations and break them into product of simpler expectations. So what we're going to do, the first case, is we're going to express the expected value of the product for this Poisson sum process as the equation shown here. So we start out with R of xy t tau. Whoops, R sub x. <laughs> And then we're going to write this as the expected value of, and this is one of those clever things. You see it, and you go, ah, I see why they did it, but you don't know maybe what motivated the first person in history to do it. <laughs> because many times people are very, very clever, and they do things, and you don't know why they did it, but it does work. And that indeed is the sort of thing that we have here. This is the expected value of x of t times x of tau minus x of t. plus x squared of t. Now, you'll agree with that. You'll agree that this becomes this if we just do the algebra, right? That this becomes this if we just do the algebra. But the ingenuity of doing this is twofold. First of all, we have a plus here, and we can uh, take out this second expected value. Right? And secondly, we have the expected value of this expression. What do we know from the previous board of x of t and the random variable x of tau minus x of t? They're independent of each other, right? They're independent, just like they were over here. And for independent random variables, the expectation of the product is the product of the expectation. Sounds like double talk, but it does mean something. The expectation of the product is equal to the product of the expectations. So this, then, is equal to the expected value of x of t times the expected value of x of tau minus t, because they're independent of each other, plus the second moment. So you see how clever we have been and what a lot of work it has saved us going from this expression to this much more clever expression, because we've been able to break it down into more elementary components. We have actually computed what this is. That's equal to lambda t, right? What is this equal to? Lambda of tau minus t. That's the expected value of number of points within that interval. And what is the last term equal to? Well, it's equal to the second moment equal to the uh, variance minus the, I guess, plus the first moment squared, right? Yeah, second moment 
is equal to the variance minus the second moment squared. You're used to seeing this as the variance is equal to the second moment minus the square of the first moment. But I'm rearranging it to get the second moment. Yeah? Oh, you're just stretching. Okay. So the variance, the variance we have seen is equal to NP cubed, right? That was equal to the variance, which in our case is equal to lambda T. Uh, let's see. Lambda t, oh no, okay, the number of points here is lambda t squared, no, just lambda t. The variance of the process is equal to lambda t, and the mean is equal to lambda t also. So that's this result. So therefore, this expected value is simply equal to lambda t times lambda tau minus t plus lambda t plus lambda t squared. By the way, this always bothers me. Uh, I have this thing that does sanity checks on terms of dimensions. And anytime I add a quantity to the square of a quantity, I got to make sure that I go back and I think, oh, if this has units of feet, this has units of feet squared, and I'm adding apples and oranges. You understand? I can't mix up the dimensions. What's the resolution to that here? Turns out this is correct. But why doesn't that dimensional check apply here? What are the units of lambda? If you look at it, it's number of occurrences per second, n over t. It has the same frequency as hertz, number of occurrences per second. T is time. So lambda T itself is like frequency times time. It is a unitless quantity. And the fact it's a unit, unitless quantity allows us to square it and maintain the dimensions. So there's no problem with adding lambda T to lambda T squared. Uh, if we do some algebra on this, let's go back to the screen here. If we do some algebra on this, we find out that the uh, final result is that the autocorrelation is equal to lambda t tau plus lambda t. But there's a caveat here. There's an assumption here. Way back in the beginning, we assumed that tau is greater than t. Remember that? That was an assumption that we made so that we can draw pictures like this with tau being greater than t. So with tau is greater than t, we have this expression. Suppose that the opposite is true. Suppose that tau is less than t. What do you think the result is? Well, we just take the t, replace it by tau, and the tau and replace it by t, and we get the result. And what we're going to do in that case is we're going to generate, if we look at both the t is greater than tau and t is less than tau, we're getting another minimum here. Which one is the minimum? And that should occur on the next slide. We'll see. Ah, here it is. So r of x of tau is equal to lambda squared t tau. And the way we get this is because if you replace t by tau and tau by t, this term remains exactly the same, right? If you replace t by tau, this becomes lambda tau. So always you have lambda squared t tau, and then you have a plus lambda t or a lambda tau, depending on which t of t a tau is bigger. And you find out which one is the smallest, and indeed that's the one you use. So in general, the autocorrelation is equal to lambda squared t tau plus lambda times the minimum of whatever the values of t and tau are. Any questions on that? Anytime one has an independent increment sort of process like this, wherein you can say the number of points on one interval is independent of the other points in the other interval, and then you use this point process to do a summation or accumulation sort of process, then you will always have this minimum coming back and staring at you because when you take the autocorrelation you're always going to be looking at the expected value of one value times another one, and one of them is going to be subsumed in the other one depending on which variable t or tau is bigger. So you always choose uh, the minimum of the two, and the minimum rears its head always in these autocorrelations. Questions at all? Okay, let's go ahead and take our five-minute break and meet back with the big hands on the six. Okay, we showed that the autocorrelation for the Poisson uh, counting process was equal to
was equal to this relationship. And of course, the autocovariance in general can be written as the autocorrelation minus the uh, expected values. And for the Poisson counting process, what is x of t, the mean? It's equal to lambda t, correct? What is x of tau? It's equal to the expected value of x of tau is equal to lambda tau. That's the expected value of points on the interval from 0 to t and on the interval from 0 to tau. So you can see, interestingly, that this expression that we subtract on is exactly equal to this first expression here. So they eat each other up. And we're left with the autocovariance of a very simple relationship, that the autocovariance of the Poisson sum process is equal to lambda times the minimum of t and tau. So that's the autocovariance of the Poisson sum process. And that, indeed, is the result that we have here on the next slide. Now, you notice what we've done for the Poisson counting process. If we've taken Poisson points and we've done counting according to the Poisson points. Uh, there's other random processes which can be related to the Poisson points. A classical one, and we're going over some, some classically used uh, stochastic processes, both in probability and plus motivated by their application. The random telegraph signal does the following. It takes Poisson points in time, so here's our Poisson points in time, and we start always at lambda is equal to 1, and then we go to the first Poisson point, and bloop, we change polarity. We go to the next Poisson point, we go bloop, we change polarity. Go to the next Poisson point, and bloop, we change polarity. So therefore, we have a bipolar signal. This is actually a, a, a discrete signal, because it can only take on values of plus and minus 1. It's not discrete time, but it's discrete in terms of its, uh, the values it can obtain. This is referred to as a random telegraph signal and is a derivative of Poisson points. And it's based on the concept of Poisson points. What we would like to do is we'd like to now analyze this Poisson process, evaluate its expected value and its uh, autocorrelation, autocovariance. <laughs> We do this, by the way, and we're going over a few of these in detail to give you an idea of the steps and the analytical approach which is required to analyze, the analytical approach which is used to analyze, to evaluate the means and the autocorrelation of stochastic processes. So here we go. Random telegraph signal. Here's what we will show. We will show that the expected value of x of t is equal to e to the minus 2 alpha t. Let me ask you this. Let's go back here. Do you think, by looking at this, I showed you the answer, and I know you have the notes before you. Well, many of you do. Do you think that the expected value of this process is a constant? The answer is no. Can anybody tell me why? What's the expected value of x at the origin? No, 1. It always starts out at 1. By definition, the telegraph signal always starts out at 1. So therefore, at the origin, it's not even a stochastic process. It's deterministic. It's always equal to 1 at the origin. What do you think the expected value is for t very, very, very large? There it would go to 0, right? Because if t is very, very, very large, the chances are of you having a plus one and a minus one, the number of them are about the same, right? So you would expect something which would go from an expected value of at the origin equal to one, which it always is. It's not stochastic at the origin. And something which would go from the origin asymptotically down to zero. And indeed, that's what this exponential of two alpha t does. Now, the way that we have defined the stochastic process, if we have defined it as Poisson points for positive time. We will also extend the, what do I do? 
We will also extend this to negative time, put Poisson points for negative time, and do the same thing for negative time. Go minus and plus, et cetera. So we'll have a symmetric sort of argument. In that case, the expected value of x of t is equal to 2 e to the minus 2 alpha times the magnitude of t. You notice that's equal to 1 at the origin. And for t very, very big, that goes to 0, consistent with our sanity check. And we will also show that the autocovariance also has the same exact result. And we're going to go through a proof of this, again, because we need some of these proofs in order to get some uh, analysis tools and experience behind our back. Let's take a look, first of all, at the expected value of x of t. If you look back at the definition for the expected value, it's equal to the number times the probability the number occurs. This is for a discrete random variable, which is the type we have. So it's equal to 1 times the probability x of t is equal to 1, plus minus 1 times the probability that x of t is equal to minus 1. Well, let's look at this. 1 times, what is the probability that x of t is equal to 1? Probability that x of t is equal to 1, if we choose a value of t here, it's the probability that the number of Poisson points on the interval from 0 to t is an even number. Because it's of an even number, it's gone down a bunch of times and up a bunch of times. But if it's an even number, it's gone down as many times as it's gone up, and it ends up up, right? So the probability that x of t is equal to 1 is equal to the probability that the number of Poisson points on that interval is even. In a similar fashion, the probability that x of t is equal to minus 1 is the probability that the number of points on 0 t is odd. Because we go up and down, but we go down one more time than we go up, and we are left at minus 1. And then we have this minus 1, which is the value that the random variable obtains. So we put the minus sign here. So we need to find out these values, the probability that the number of points on 0 of t is even. Well, if we look at this, what is the probability that the number of points on 0 of t is even? That means the probability that there are 0 points, or there are 2 points, or there are 4 points, or there are 6 points, or there are 8 points, etc. So therefore, we have to look at all these probabilities. Each one of those is mutually exclusive of the other one, so we can simply add them up. So the probability that the number of points on 0 of t is even is equal to the probability that there's zero points, plus the probability that there's two points, plus the probability that there's four points, etc. So the probability that there's zero points is equal to, let's take two points, it's easier. e to the minus lambda t, lambda t is squared over 2 factorial. That's the probability that there's two points. The probability that there's four points is lambda t to the fourth over 4 factorial. So it's every other term, toim, toim, term of the Poisson expansion. The probability that there are zero points, if you evaluate this for lambda t to the 0 over 0 factorial, you get 1. Well, you look at this expansion, and this goes on and on forever with the uh, exponents being equal to even numbers. And this turns out to be the Taylor series expansion for the hyperbolic cosine. How many have seen the hyperbolic cosine before? Mm. Not a lot. OK, the hyperbolic cosine the cosh of j times uh, x is equal to the cosine of x. The cosh of x is e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2. You notice instead of x, we put jx. We have kind of an Euler formula. If we put a jx instead of x. So if we look at the actual cosh, you notice it's an even function. It has a value of 1 at the origin. And it goes up here and here. Um, asymptotically, it approaches a e to the x. Now what did I do in e to the x? Let's see, it's a little bit bigger than e to the x. I don't know. It, it asks, I'm not sure exactly how it goes, but it asymptotically approaches an e to the x over here, and over here it approaches an e to the minus x, I guess over 2. I guess it would go down like this. 
So that's what a hyperbolic cosine is equal to. Uh, we'll also deal with a hyperbolic sine, which is equal to e to the x plus minus e to the minus x over 2. That's the hyperbolic sine. Hyperbolic sine is an odd function. It looks like this. It also, as time increases, asymptotically approaches e to the x over 2. And down here, it asymptotically approaches e minus e to the minus x over 2. So that's what it looks like. Hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine. You'll notice something even interesting is that you've probably uh, recognized that every function can be uniquely decomposed into an even and odd function. Have you ever heard of this concept before? Every function can be expressed uniquely in terms of an even and odd function. You will notice that the sine of x, the, sine, the sinh of x plus the cosh of x is equal to e to the x. Right? And in fact, the hyperbolic sine is the odd component of e to the x. The hyperbolic cosine is the even component of e to the x. You have seen e to the x written as a Taylor series expansion. Correct? And this is equal to the cosh of x plus the sinh of x. This is an even function, and this is an odd function. How many know what I mean by even and odd? OK, good. How many know what I know by even and odd? I was assuming, OK, good, good. So therefore, the cosh of x would be equal to this is an engineer sort of explanation. It would contain all of the even components of this expansion, right? You'll notice this has, a, this has terms like x to the 1 over 1 factorial. Is that even or odd? Odd. What about x squared over 2 factorial? Even or odd? Even. x3 over 3 factorial is odd again, etc. So all of the even terms are, are even, and all the odd terms are odd. So if we just take just the even terms of this, we get the following. If we just take the even terms. In a similar fashion, if we just take the odd terms, we obtain this result. So you notice that the cosh is equal to 1 plus x squared over 2 factorial plus x to the 4th over 4 factorial plus x to the 6th over 6 factorial, etc. So it's all of the even terms up here, whereas the sinh or the hyperbolic cosine is all of the odd terms for the Taylor series expansion. So that's a reason that when we look at this expression, if we can go back to the screen now, we have 1 plus the even term plus the next even term corresponding to 4, etc. So these are all of the even terms for the Taylor series expansion of e to, the, e to the lambda t. So we recognize then that all of the even terms correspond to the even portion of e to, the, e to the lambda t, which of course is the hyperbolic cosine. So the probability that the number of points on 0 to t of is even is equal to lambda e to the minus lambda t times the hyperbolic cosine, as we have here. Well, I think you can see what's coming. The probability that the number of points on 0 t is odd is a probability that the points number of points are 1 or 2, oh, I'm sorry, 1 or 3 or 5 or 7, all of the odd components. So here's a probability that it's 1. They're mutually exclusive, so we can add the probabilities. Probability that it's 3, the probability that it's 5, etc. And so these are the odd terms of the Taylor series expansion of e to the minus lambda t and correspond to a hyperbolic sign. So the result is, is that the probability that the number of points on 0 t is odd is equal to e to the minus lambda t times the hyperbolic sine of lambda of t. 
So, do you remember why we're doing this? Well, if t is greater than 0, we were supposed to find the expected value of x of t. This was about three slides ago, and I've recopied this equation. It's 1 times the probability x of t is equal to 1, minus the probability that x of t is equal to minus 1. We figured that's the probability the number of points is even, minus the probability that the number of points is odd. We figured that out, so it's e to the minus lambda t times the hyperbolic cosine minus the hyperbolic sine. If we put all of that together, we get e to the minus 2 lambda t as being equal to the expected value of the, of the telegraph random process. Now, this, of course, assumes that t is greater than 0. If we have all values of t, that is, we extend this telegraph signal for negative time also, doing the same thing, putting Poisson points for negative time and then flipping every time we reach one, then the expected value of x of t is equal to e to the minus 2 alpha times the magnitude of t. This is the expected value of the process, of the telegraph stochastic process. Yes, question? If those points, instead of being uh, randomly distributed, if they were distributed in, in uh, distinct intervals, like say, if you had a point every, every one second, could you go and show that the probability of it being even or odd would be one half? It's totally, it's totally a different problem. The question was, let me see if I understood this. Let me rephrase your question, and, and you tell me if I have it right. You said, let's divide up the timeline into time intervals. OK? And what we're going to do is, every interval, we're going to take a random number generator between 0 and 1 and choose a point here, right? No? Uh, not, not oh, okay. What were you asking then? Uh, like, so the, the points you say in a sort of Poisson process, uh, what, if, what if they didn't? What if they were, what if one thing happened every second? And at the same exact time, on the second? Well, it wouldn't be stochastic then, would it? Right, it wouldn't be stochastic. Right. Could you, could you use that to show that, like, I'm just thinking the, the, the obvious thing is that if it happened every single second, then the probability of it would be one half. Yes. No, because the probability of what you're asking occurring is equal to zero. Maybe I don't understand the question. Okay. I will say, however, that there is an entire area of stochastic processes, which, which is referred to as point processes, that correspond to points which are in some way distributed on a line. And the Poisson process is not the only process that indeed exists. Um, you can take any stochastic process, say noise, a very common way to do this is take, to take any process, and then look at the points corresponding to the zero crossings. This can give you wildly varying different uh, distributions of points. And the Poisson process is not the only process which you can use to model things such as this. Also, point processes. <coughs> are such that, you know, e even for the Poisson, that the value of lambda can be a function of t. When you pop popcorn, for example, you know you put it in the microwave, and then you hear a pop, 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 pop. And then all of a sudden, it's constant, pop, 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 pop. And then it starts to go away after about three minutes, pop, 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 pop. So actually, your lambda, your number of occurrences per second, is actually uh, a function of time in that case. So you can see there's a whole different uh, plethora of models that we can use for point processes, the occurrences of points on a line. When we talk about a Poisson process, of course, we're talking about the Poisson process in here, where the lambda is basically a constant. So I'm sorry if I misunderstood your, your question. If you want to ask me after class, maybe we could clear that up then. OK? So this is the uh, expected value. Now what we're going to do. Guess what we're going to do now? The autocorrelation. That's right. We've done the expected value. We need to do the autocorrelation. Now, the expected value was rough. Where do you think the autocorrelation is going to be? Also rough, but fun. We're going to assume as before t is greater than tau. And uh, you'll notice that if we look at x of t times x of tau, what is the autocorrelation? 
the autocorrelation is equal to That's the definition of the autocorrelation. For the telegraph signal, what can this be? Well, x of t can only take on two values, plus one and minus one. Therefore, the only thing that this x of t times x of tau can take on is a plus one or a minus one. Either x of t times x of tau is equal to plus one or is equal to minus one. You agree with that? For just dealing with ones and minus ones, that's all we have. So here's kind of a, <clears throat> a little graph that we have. For the squares here, that's when x of t x of tau is equal to minus 1. What we have here is the x-axis is x of t. The y-axis is x of tau. Clearly, the product is equal to 1 if both are equal to 1. The product is equal to 1 if both are equal to minus 1. And similarly, the product is equal to minus 1 uh, for the other two corners of the square. So this constitutes the four possible outcomes of the product x of t times x of tau. To figure out the expected value, and therefore the autocorrelation of the expected value, uh, of the, to figure out the autocorrelation, we want to figure out the probability of this, the probability of this, the probability of this, and the probability of this. Once we have that, we can compute the expected value of the uh, x of t times x of tau. So let's look first of all at the probability that x of t times x of tau is equal to 1. That's equal to the probability that x of t is equal to 1 and x of tau is equal to 1, right? Or x of t is equal to minus 1 and x of tau is equal to minus 1. And I maintain I can put a plus here. Why can I put a plus here? Because these two events are mutually exclusive, right? So therefore, I can put a plus here. And I can spend my time now evaluating this and this. So what I'm doing, I'm evaluating the probability mass function for this point, for this term, and this point for this second term. <clears throat> for this first term, the way I'm going to do it is take this probability and express it in terms of a conditional probability. Doing so will make it easier for me to evaluate. <clears throat> And you'll see why in a second. Remember with the incremental increments, how we divided it up into two different intervals? We're going to do the same thing here. Divide it up into two different intervals, but using a different technique. So we're doing that interval division into independent intervals. We're doing it in a number of different ways. <clears throat> this first one, by conditional probability, is the probability x of t is equal to 1 given x of tau is equal to 1 times the probability x of tau is equal to 1. That's just conditional probability. Right? In a similar fashion, we can do this for the second term and write it as a conditional probability also. Although my analysis, by the way, is for t, t greater than tau, when I get to the end, I can just interchange t and tau and get the expression for the complement of this assumption. So let's take a look at uh, these. Now, how does this correspond to the uh, interval? Let me show you how it corresponds to the interval. We have t, t greater than tau. So we have x of t up here, and we have x of tau down here. So here's t, and here's tau. And here's our telegraph process. And what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to compute the expected value. If t is greater than tau, we're trying to compute the expected value. I'm sorry, the probability. That x of t times x of tau. Now, x of t is equal to 1, sorry. And x of tau is equal to 1. And then we're writing this as a conditional probability, the probability that uh, x of t is equal to 1, given that x of tau is equal to 1, 
given this is a conditional probability, we have to multiply this by the probability that x of tau is equal to 1. Remember with our sum process and our counting process, how we divided the intervals into disjoint intervals where we could take advantage of the independence in each interval? We're doing the same thing here. And look at this. The probability that x tau is equal to 1 and x tau is equal, given that x tau is equal to minus 1. Notice that's nothing more than the probability that the points, that the number of points on the interval from tau to t is what? Even. Right? So therefore, by breaking it up into this conditional probability, I can just look at this interval and ask myself, is the number of points there even? Agreed? Well, no, I'm asking x of t is equal to 1 and x of tau is equal to 1. Let's look at the definition of the problem I'm trying to solve. I'm trying to solve the probability x of t is equal to 1 and x of tau is equal to 1. OK. So by doing it this way, I've, again, partitioned my problem, as I've done in the last two cases. I've partitioned it just looking at this interval, and then the probability that x of tau is equal to 1, I only have to worry about this interval. So I've broken up the problem into looking at two intervals with, which are disjoint again. So this theme is recurring throughout these autocorrelation computations, is looking at these disjoint intervals. And I figured out what this is already. What is this equal to? e to the minus 2 lambda tau. That's what I figured out in the first part of the uh, exercise in this lecture. Yeah? How do you evaluate the value of x t if there is a jump at t and tau? Ah. Very good question. Suppose that there is a jump between t and tau. In other words, suppose that my interval stops or starts on a Poisson point. Is that the question? Well, first of all, I have to ask myself, what is the probability that a point that occurs? Zero. That's zero probability. So it's not worth talking about. Occurs at t and tau. I mean, at the bond, the bond places. Your question is: is whether one or both of the interval points can actually jump at a Poisson point? I think is that correct? I mean, I think that it's at t and tau. I mean, between the I mean, on the boundaries. I mean, there is jump on the boundary. Let me let me ask you this: Are you asking if we have Poisson points here? What happens if the jumps occur on the boundaries? That the probability of that happening is zero. If we're talking about a continuous time process. OK. The probability of that happening is zero. If you're talking about discrete time, a discrete Poisson process where you have quantized time to get up with a discrete process, then you do have a finite probability. But it's a different problem then. OK. So let's return to these th thrilling <coughs> results. OK. I think this is really neat stuff. The probability that x of t is equal to 1 given that x of tau is equal to minus 1 is the same as the probability of x of t is equal to minus 1 and x of, given x of tau is equal to minus 1. Do you agree with that? Let me say it again slower. The probability you go to from 1 to 1 on an interval is the same as the probability you go from minus 1 to minus 1 on that same interval. And in both cases, that's equal to the probability the number of points on t tau is even. Right? What I put on the board and we just talked about was this. Probability that x of t is equal to 1 given that x of tau is equal to 1 is equal to the probability that the number of points on t tau is even. Well, we have worked that out before. That is equal to the, oh, this is wrong. 
There should be an e to the minus lambda. No, that's right. No, e to the minus lambda t minus tau here. Sorry about that. Should be an e to the minus lambda t over tau. So there's a word of it. Let me write it down. No, is that right? Yeah, this is right. This is right. In other words, that expression should be this. Sorry about that. Do you agree with that? You do. OK, good. Somebody said, yeah, so it must be right. <laughs> OK, thus, uh, if we look at the probability that x of t is equal to minus 1, x of t is equal to 1, that's equal to this expression. Well, the first expression, this conditional probability, is the Cauch. Notice I have the lambda tau minus. OK, I need an e to the. I still need an e to the minus lambda t minus tau here also. So this first term is equal to this expression, and the second term is equal to this expression. So that's a probability that x of t is equal to 1 and x of t, x of tau is equal to 1. And I apologize for the math mistakes. I'll, I'll correct those on the overheads on the web. In a similar fashion, I make the same mistake here for the minus 1. But the point is, is that in both cases, once I correct the math here, I will get the probability that x of t is equal to 1 and x of tau is equal to minus 1, as well as the probability that x of t is equal to minus 1 and x of tau is equal to minus 1. So therefore, my two squares, what I have done is I have evaluated the probability of these two points on this two-dimensional plane. Right? I've evaluated the probability of the two points on this two-dimensional plane. Now what I need to do is I need to evaluate these two points. OK, here we go. Onward. <clears throat> the probability that x of t is equal to 1 and x of tau is equal to minus 1. We break it up into conditional probabilities again. And here, we have the probability that the number of points is odd if it goes from 1 to a minus 1 or a minus 1 to a 1. Here also should be an e to the minus lambda t minus tau. So this, this expression is wrong. It should be accompanied by an exponential. And when we put all of the things to it, I'm going to gloss over the math since there are uh, errors in it, is that we finally get expressions for the two points here. Both of these expressions should be multiplied by, this expression should be multiplied by e to the minus lambda t minus tau. e to the minus lambda t minus tau. This expression should be multiplied by e to the minus lambda t minus tau. And if we obtain that, we obtain these two points. So therefore, we obtain, obtain the probability for a given value of t and tau, but of course tau t has to be greater than tau, the probability that this occurs, this occurs, this occurs, and this occurs. Well, if we have that, we have enough to compute the probability or the expected value of x of t times x of tau. I think this is the same expression as before. I think I doubled the slide. So. We have r sub x, which is the autocorrelation. Remember what we're talking about? Telegraph signal? Remember that? It's equal to the expected value of x of t minus x of tau. We have all of these expressions in place. So it's simply a matter of evaluating a typical expected value. It's the probability times the value, the summation of those terms. And if we do that, we get some, something which looks ugly, but when we get down to it, here's the result. That the autocovariance is equal to e to the minus 2 alpha. And assuming a, that the telegraph signal goes for negative time, too, Poisson points for negative time, it's equal to e to the minus 2 alpha magnitude to t minus tau. So we've gone through some of the details of the derivation for this uh, stochastic process for good reason. The recurring theme in all of these is when we talk about the x of t minus times x of tau, is that we have been to cleverly been able to cleverly divide the intervals into disjoint intervals over which we can take advantage of analyzing each individual 
interval separately and combining the results to get the autocorrelation. We saw this in the sum process. We saw this in the Poisson sum process, the Poisson counting process, and we've seen it here in the random telegraph signal also. We have already seen two stochastic processes which are related to the Poisson stochastic process. We've seen the Poisson counting process, and we have seen the telegraph process. Both of them take advantage of points, Poisson points on a line. We can also talk about a Poisson point process. A point process is a derivative of the counting process. Huh? Huh? What does that mean? Remember the counting process? We started off with some Poisson points here. And every time we hit a Poisson point, we ratcheted up one. We called this x of t. We're going to say z of t. Let me do a different color here. z of t is going to be equal to the derivative of x of t of this counting process. Now, the derivative of a step, of course, is always a delta function. And it's a delta function, in this case, with unit area, because each one of these discontinuities is going to have a value of 1. So that means that z of t is going to be a process corresponding to Dirac deltas every place where we have a Poisson point. This will be referred to as a Poisson point process. It is a stochastic process, which is a sequence of, again, Dirac deltas occurring everywhere that there is a Poisson point. I have down here page 352. Okay, page 352 basically gives the same thing that I just drew on the board here. Could we get a close-up right there? The right here, we have our Poisson counting process. And then we take the derivative of it. And the actual z of t can be written as the summation of k is equal to 1 to infinity of a delta function, Dirac delta, of t minus s sub k, where s sub k corresponds to the kth Poisson point location. So we have a number of, uh, of individual jumps here. Now, shot noise, which occurs in uh, solid state electronics <coughs> and uh, photocells and a number of other places, corresponds to doing the following. Taking z of t, we can think of it this way, running it through a linear time invariant filter, remember this stuff, and getting out a process called v of t. Do you remember linear time invariant filters? This is a double E class. We had, if we had x of t deterministically, and we have h of t, and we had y of t, and this, this of course, was what type of system? A linear time invariant system, right? Linear time invariant system. In that case, y of t, or what is h of t, first of all? It's the impulse response. It is what we would obtain if we took a Dirac delta and we put it in here and we obtained the output. The output would be h of t. So h of t is referred to, if you recall, as the impulse response of the system. If we Fourier transform it, we get what? The frequency response of the system function goes by different names. Uh, but because this is time invariant, if we put in a del of t minus tau, where tau is a fixed number, into this system, what do we get out? h of t minus tau. Because it's shift invariant, the system doesn't change with respect to time. If it has resistors in it, those resistors have the same value. If they're 2 ohms today, they'll be 2 ohms tomorrow. If the resistors are changing with respect to time, then the system itself is changing with respect to time, and it is no longer time invariant. Another thing, too, is that if we put in 6 times x of t, 
we put in x of t and got out y of t, if we put in 6 times x of t, what would we get out? 6 times y of t. This is the homogeneity property of linear systems. And there's also something which says that if we put in x1 plus x2, we get out what? y1 plus y2. The response of the sum is the sum of the responses, more of that double talk. The response of the sum is the sum of the responses. And if a system displays homogeneity and additivity, together these properties are referred to as being linear. <clears throat> if it obeys the shift property, it is said to be time invariant. So we talk about LTI, or linear time invariant systems. Well, the interesting thing here, if we return to the stochastic processes, we recognize that even for stochastic processes, if this was, oh, we forgot something here, didn't we? What is the relationship between x of t and y of t? y is equal to x convolved with h, right? y is equal to x convolved with h. Suppose that instead of a deterministic input, we took this LTI system and we put in a stochastic input. Say we put in a stochastic input, capital X. The output would still be X convolved with H. The output would be exactly the same expression, except that the input is a stochastic process. The output is also a stochastic process. But the actual mathematical relationship that we use to govern the input-output relationship for an LTI system is still X convolved with H, which is the impulse response. Okay? Therefore, if we have Z of T, which is the summation of these impulse responses, S sub K is what the author refers to as the Poisson point. So this would be S sub 1, S sub 2, S sub 3, S sub 4, etc. Then what is the output V of T? Well, each one of these delta functions, as we see here, delta T minus tau, corresponds to a shift. And then by superposition, we get these shifts superimposed. So the output is H of T minus S sub K where the uh, H corresponds to the impulse response. So what this looks like then is suppose that the system impulse response just for talking is a simple, uh, say a simple exponential dying down. So it's a simple RC circuit. In that case, then the uh, impulse would go like this and then And this blue curve would be the V of T, which would be the output of the system. This V of T is also going to be a stochastic process. Remember what a stochastic process is? It's a random variable, which is a function of time. There is a stochastic component to V of T. That's the Poisson point. So therefore, it's stochastic. And this process, V of T, is referred to as shot noise. It is simply the replication of the impulse response of the system. and is a Poisson point derivative. Any questions at all? OK, thank you very much. We'll see you next Tuesday. Oh, wait, 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 wait. I forgot something. Don't go. Don't go. OK, what we will do is we will have the test up through it, but not including the Wiener process on 354. Up through and including the Wiener process on page 354. And up through and including? No, up, did I say not, not including? Does not include the Wiener process. OK? Does not improve the Wiener process. So this next slide, which I'm about to show you, the Wiener process is not on the examination. We'll also be posting homework, which is not due. Okay, that'll be posted tomorrow before the Thanksgiving break. Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, I'll post. Yes, we'll post the solutions. Yes. Test is one week from Thursday.
Okay, thank you very much.